That was a typical Wednesday, I think. If you could get your hands on any one piece of tech, not just to review, what would it be? Oh, Jem, you have no idea how much I wanna drive an electric ute. I'm talking stuff like the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Rivian R1T or the Hummer EV. Are they good? I don't know, but they look fun as heck to camp in. But the thing is, none of them are available in Australia yet. None of them. Uh, we currently have one electric ute on the market here. It just came out and apparently it sucks. We'd say Australia's first electrified dual cab production ute needs to return to the drawing board. But one day, one day, I will venture out to the mountains beyond my backyard, look up at the stars as I lay in the tray of one of these beautiful electric utes and think to myself, yeah, this is living. And I really hope there's a charger somewhere close because my battery is about to die. What products would you have never considered purchasing until you did a review and found out you liked them more than you anticipated? Great question. This has actually happened to me a lot over the last couple of years. I have three main ones. Number one, mechanical keyboards. I always thought they were kind of unnecessary and kind of like the equivalent of buying a really loud car just to show off. I'll admit it, I was so wrong. Logitech actually gave me this one to... <laughs> there goes a key. In the 2021, Logitech gave me the G915 to review and that changed my clickety clackety tune pretty damn quick. This hasn't left my desk since. And now I own three. Mechanical keyboards are comfortable, they're responsive, and this one in particular is just absolutely perfect for my needs. Do yourself a favor and get yourself a mechanical keyboard. You deserve it. Number two is the PlayStation 5. I have a gaming PC, I have a Switch, and to be honest, I don't have a lot of time to play video games these days. So I never thought I would buy myself a PlayStation 5. I've never owned any other of the PlayStation consoles anyway, because to be, to be frank, I really don't like the way that Sony makes their controllers. They, they do not feel good to hold. But about nine months after it launched, I got to review one and immediately realized just how good the PS5's controller is. I have completely switched over to the PS5 controller now. If I can, I'll do as much gaming as possible on this thing. Xbox controllers don't even hold a candle to this. I love it. I didn't immediately buy a PS5 at the time because they were still impossible to find and frankly didn't have enough games on the system yet to be worth it. But it's been niggling away at the back of my head ever since and in December, I finally bought myself one. And I freaking love it. I got myself a PS Plus subscription, so I'm making my way through the back catalog that I miss. I'm finding more and more to be impressed about with the power of the console and the controller and my PSVR 2 just arrived. It is a very good console and it is an amazing time to own one. Get yourself a PS5. You deserve it. <laughs> and the third, I say begrudgingly, it's the iPhone. I hate how the iPhone is. It just constantly feels like Apple are holding back on what it could be compared to the stuff that Android's doing. But then you use the thing and you realize that it just works. You've got all the Apple integrations. It has more exclusive apps and the apps run better in most situations. It's durable as all hell. It's got an incredible battery. As far as phones go, you can just take this out of the box and know that it will run well. And yeah, it makes this a very compelling phone. So get yourself an iPhone 14 Pro, you deserve it. If you're interested in my full length review of the iPhone 14 Pro, great news, it's finally coming out next week. So uh, hit subscribe if you wanna be notified when that video comes out so you can tell if you need to buy an iPhone 14 Pro or not. Uh, maybe just hold off actually buying it until you watch that video because this phone is definitely not for everybody. It might be for the next person though. What would be the best starter camera for YouTube content? The best camera that you can get right now is most likely the latest iPhone or the latest Samsung models. You should go for the pro version if you're looking for the absolute best in mobile cameras because they have the telephoto lenses and they've probably got a few more software features, but even their cheaper counterparts like the iPhone 14 here will do a really good job in getting YouTube content made. Whenever I make this suggestion, people always ask, why are you suggesting phones over cameras? Well, they have limited manual controls so you can really focus on storytelling and composition while you're shooting. 
Honestly, that's what you need to get good at first if you're making YouTube content. Learning how cameras work and how to do all the technical stuff with those, that is a great skill to have in itself, but it's not what makes YouTube great. YouTube is about making engaging videos that people actually wanna watch, and you can do all of that on a phone. Plus, if you just have a go using the phone that you've already got, and maybe it's not even an iPhone 14, maybe it's from years ago, you'll still get the opportunity to practice the craft of making a YouTube video and even just test out if you like doing the process of creation for YouTube again and again and again. Once you realize that you love it or maybe you hate it, then you can go into buying some more expensive gear. Another great advantage of phones, you can edit and publish your videos on them. You can do everything from one device and it's all fairly intuitive. Personally, I still use the iPhone 14 Pro Max to shoot on over the S23 Ultra because I prefer the look out of this camera and it also shoots in ProRes. And that's a file format that allows me to do a bit more in my editing software when I'm editing this stuff on my computer. But if you're looking for good footage directly out of the camera, the S23 Ultra has a really nice, bright, vibrant look that seems to really please people on social media. It's also got two telephoto lenses, a three times and a 10 times, as opposed to the iPhone's single three times telephoto zoom. And that 10 times does actually come in handy quite often when you're shooting stuff like birds and faraway things. Honestly, both of these phones are amazing at capturing video. So if you have to pick, really just go for whichever your favorite operating system is, and you'll be sure that you've got something that can capture YouTube worthy video in your pocket at all times. That's pretty exciting. If that answer didn't quite satisfy you and you actually really do want to talk about camera equipment, um, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll make a separate entire video about what camera to get into if you're starting from scratch. It's a big topic, so it does deserve its own video. But yeah, if you're interested, let me know. And if enough people tell me, I'll, I'll make the video. I, I'm here to teach. Please tell me the full name of the channel is actually award nominated journalist Tobias G Venus. No, but check back in three months when I change it to award winning. That's not true, I never win anything. Don't know if you've gotten this question before, but what's your favorite band slash artist? No, no one's actually asked me this before and it's actually taken me a lot of thought, but I've come to the realization that it's probably Linkin Park. So remember those end credit Transformer memes that were going around? It was like movies ending with what I've done by Linkin Park. I even made one for the latest Apple event. Have a great day. While I was working on that meme, I was just listening to what I've done and just bopping my head along and going, wow, yeah, this, this song actually rocks. This is great. And then I fell into a Linkin Park hole. So in the second half of last year, I just listened to and watched so much of their stuff, as much as I could. And I realized I must have forgotten just how much I liked Linkin Park when they were at their peak and I was in high school. I remember as a kid, I'd spent all the money I'd save on a PSP and a memory stick duo. Also, seriously, f Sony for making a proprietary memory stick that had like megabytes of data for over a hundred dollars. That, that made me completely broke as a child. So I couldn't afford an MP3 player. Luckily, the PSP was a really capable MP3 player in itself. And it came with headphones. One of my friends who was a massive music nerd gave me a USB, which was filled with albums that he had recommended to me, all downloaded using his parents' blazing fast ADSL one internet. It was there that I found Linkin Park's first two albums. My angsty teenage brain immediately latched onto their new metal sounds, Mike Shinoda's rap flow, and Chester Bennington's harsh yet soothing voice. After that, those albums never left my PSP. Basically, whenever I was on the bus to school or doing chores at home, I would listen to these albums and, and the, the music would just inspire me to think of the coolest video game or movie scenes you've ever heard of. And every time I listen to those songs, even now, I'm transported back to those worlds that I'd built inside of my head. When I got back into listening to Linkin Park just recently, all of that came flooding back. And that's been quite a trip, honestly. And it's been a great time to be a Linkin Park fan. They just put out an unreleased song from 20 years ago. It's been really good to hear from them, even if the lyrics are a little haunting. Yeah, I guess my favorite band is Linkin Park. There you go. What are the main challenges faced as a photographer and as a YouTuber? Great question from Stonio. I would say photographer and YouTuber are two very different jobs, but because they're in creative industries, there is a lot of overlap. So here are two challenges that both are affected by. Number one is making money. 
yeah, it's tough out there. The knowledge and the tools required to make stuff like this is more accessible than ever. So there are a lot of people trying to do this as a full-time job right now. I'm seeing teenagers with skills that eclipse 60 year old seasoned veterans that I've worked with. That competition means it's kind of hard to find work sometimes because the market is so saturated. It also means that prices are often pushed way down because there's always going to be someone cheaper than you. For YouTubers, it means you're competing with more and more channels, as well as literally every other thing a human could occupy themselves with. You pretty much have to keep up with what's trending on YouTube and what the best practices are at the time to ensure you've even got a shot at turning your views into some sort of cash flow. But it's up to you how you market yourself. How do you get work? How do you get views? Maybe you've got a distinct style that no one else can replicate. Perhaps you are just super charismatic. so everyone just naturally wants to work with you. Or perhaps you do what I do and try and do the best job possible while making it as smooth an experience for the client. That way they'll want to work with you again and maybe even refer you to their friends and colleagues. And this kind of leads me into the second challenge. You're never really just a YouTuber or a photographer. You have to learn how to manage money. You've got to market yourself, network, make a website, manage clients, PR, sponsorship deals, affiliate links. You also need to learn production from top to bottom so you can do it all. You also have to learn how to host and be on camera. All of this stuff eats into the time spent getting better and just having fun doing the thing that you actually love, the thing that you started this project for. Being a professional creative can really wear you down really quickly if you're not prepared to do this stuff. And the roughest and most ironic part of all, if you haven't earned any money yet, you can't even pay professionals to do those jobs better for you. So you kind of have to learn how to do it all at the beginning. Like I said, it's, it's tough out there. I feel like right here would be a really great time to sell you something like Skillshare. Like you can learn all about these things on Skillshare. I kind of can, they're not paying for this, but I did recently become an affiliate there. So if you are considering learning a new skill and want to try out Skillshare's massive library of high quality classes, I have a link below and clicking that will directly support this channel. See, like I said, the hustle never stops. Welcome to content creation, folks. Hi, what do you do with all your tech? By any chance, do you resell them for a cheaper price? I'm a student and been struggling to keep up with technology advancements in education. Yeah, this is a question that I actually get asked quite a lot. And it makes me sad when I go into my comments and see so many people asking for the tech for free or asking to buy it at a discount. Everyone just can't buy all the tech all the time. And it's getting more and more expensive these days. And, and there's so much cool stuff, but there's not really much I can do. The truth is I send most of the tech that I review back because, well, it's the same for companies. They don't have two and a half thousand dollars to spend on just handing a phone over to me. So it ends up back at the supplier. Some cheaper stuff like the keyboard, I do get to keep. And my phones that do end up staying here, I like to hold on to so I can use them as comparisons against the next iteration. It does mean I have a drawer full of phones and believe me, I feel incredibly guilty about it, but that's my job, I guess. Why Rusty One Eye? He lose other one. Oh, actually he's in a book. Do you want to see the book? It's really cool. Let's go. So this is a book called Lost But Found by Peter Sharp, who is a Sydney pet photographer. And he takes photos of dogs that come into Sydney Dogs and Cats home uh, and and are lost. And um, he takes before up photos and after photos. This is our bookmark, which is uh, Rusty um, looking very thick uh, and, and well fed. So he's fine now. But this is what he looked like when he first came into Sydney Dogs and Cats Homes. And you can see just how gunky and uh, just, just bad his eye is there. So they had to remove it. It was basically cancerous and um, and just filled with, with gunk. So um, they, they cut it out. Now, being a, being a Sharpe, uh, he's got a lot of extra skin. So they basically were just able to fold his eye over and um, he, it doesn't really uh, bother him too much, except when he runs into walls. So there he is, uh, just after we got him. The text in here kind of explains what happened to him, uh, how old he was when they found him, and a little bit about Chris and myself and, and when we picked him up. So um, yeah, it's a really nice book and it's really cool that we've, uh, that we've got this little memento of, of, of his time before he joined us. 
Yeah. But yes, to answer your question, one eye, because that's his that's his other eye, and that's not cool. <laughs> Like and subscribe.